the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you will find this scripture. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Verse 5, you'll find my text. I told you these things. I want to drive that thought home because I find it very difficult to get people to listen, to hear, to understand. And in the study of the Holy Scriptures, when a man or woman or young person will open their mind and let the Spirit of God begin to reveal the mysteries of God, the secrets of God, as they're revealed in this book, then and only then does that person begin to enlarge their understanding of the attributes of our God and of His will for mankind. There's not any study in the Scriptures that is of greater importance than the study of prophecy. For a man or woman to have a clear understanding of future things. Now there's no need of kidding ourselves and we've been pretty well brainwashed in some areas into thinking that it's uh, archaic and and behind the times and all of this business to study prophecy. And the critics of the Word of God have led us to believe that, you know, everything continue as they were from the beginning, and, and a preacher that talks about last things is just sort of off of his rocker or something. But now the Apostle Paul did not, he did not refrain, but rather preached and preached with a great deal of anointing the blessed truths of the coming of Jesus Christ. And this chapter opens with that. In fact, the matter of the first chapter is talking about the revelation coming of our Lord and our Savior in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power? All right then. I want you to notice the people as they're described in these verses in this chapter. And if you'll notice in verse 2, which I read to you, you will have a people that have been quite disturbed. Paul said, be not troubled. Don't let your spirit be troubled in spirit. And he said, uh, don't you let your minds be shaken. And uh, then he adds further, not by word nor by letter as from us concerning the day of Christ. Now, men and women, you can hear many voices today relative to this matter of the Lord's coming. A fellow was telling me uh, yesterday about a man. He'd said something about the Lord was coming back, and this fellow, he really had a fit. He just really, he went into, he went into orbit because uh, he doesn't believe the Lord's coming back. And he became incensed at this fellow for even mentioning the fact the Lord is coming back. Well, he said he would be back. And if he said he would be back, then I take it that he means what he says. And he's coming back just like he went away. Now you will notice there were some disturbed people. And this is why a lot of people are disturbed today. They have misconcepts concerning the Lord's return. How he's coming back and why he's coming back. And the purpose of his coming. All of this business and people are confused and you know they're all mixed up. I can tell you why he's coming back. He's coming back after his people to reward them for the deeds done in the body whether they be good or bad. Now he's coming back for that purpose. Now there are other things. He's coming back to redeem nature too. And thank God for that according to Romans 8 
but he's coming back to reward his people. He said, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. But these people who are disturbed about the coming of the Lord and they get all bothered and they say, well, he's not coming and they, they hate his coming and they despise it. It simply reveals the fact that they are troubled and they don't want to see him. Some of you people listening to me today, <clears throat> now you don't want to see the Lord and the reason you don't want to see him is simply because you're not living right. If you were living right, his coming in your life could be imminent at any time and you'd want to see him. And if you're troubled about this, this is why. If it disturbs you, this is why. Now these people were troubled and they were troubled because uh, they didn't have the right attitude about the Lord's return. Now if you understand that he's coming is for the primary purpose of bringing the body of Christ together <coughs> and uh, to be rewarded and to be given that which they have earned in faithful service, then you've got the right concept and you'll understand it and it'll be meaningful to you. I want to ask you something. Why does the preacher get up and tell you to tithe, to come for visitation, to drive a bus, or to invest in the landmark hour broadcast? That's crazy for a man to do that if there wasn't some aftermath, if there wasn't something in return, if there wasn't something uh, that would be of benefit to you. That's why we offer the Revelation series so that we can share with people uh, in-depth study of the Word of God just for your faithfulness and in investing in a broadcast. And uh, that's why I invite our people to come for calling on Monday evening or to be here for prayer meeting on Wednesday evening. Are you men to drive a bus? Because I believe that there are rewards at the end of life's journey for the man or woman who will be faithful. In the book of the Revelation, again, it said, Blessed, is the blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they do rest from their labors and their works follow them. You'll never do a good deed in the name of Jesus Christ, even to the giving a cup of cold water in his name without receiving a reward for it. That's what he says. Now, I know some people, you know, they facetiously say, well, I don't believe you ought to serve God for rewards. Well, you ought to get right with God. I think you ought to serve God for rewards. There's no need of being hypocritical about it. Brother, I'm preaching day and night and going day and night for what I'm going to get at the end of the way. I'm making investment. I'm not stupid. I just look that way. I've got good sense. There's a payday coming. And if I believe that there's a payday uh, for the Hitlers and the, and the wicked people of past generations, bless God, there's a payday for the Christian. And we ought, not to be, we ought not to be troubled. We ought to be thrilled and invigorated and challenged and intoxicated on the opportunities of Christian service. It's more than that. According to verse 3, these people here had been deceived, some of them. My, how sad and pathetic it is. I wish I could even mention on radio some of these, some of these shysters that's on radio and how they've got this and that and other things just for the pure reason of raising money. And I ought not say this, and yet I think I should because it's like someone has said, every time God calls a preacher, the devil calls one. Sometimes I think the, Lord, the, the devil's ahead of the Lord. And real God called men. Let me tell you people something. Now you get this. The devil is out to deceive as many Christians as he possibly can. Not only to blind the unbeliever, but to deceive Christians and keep Christians from making the proper investments and for living the way you ought to live to make your life fruitful and worthwhile in the master's service. Now there's no need of kidding yourself. This is the truth. And while you're looking at that, at that facet of it, being deceived, why Jesus in the book of Matthew chapter 24, when the disciples were asking about, he was, they were asking him about when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age, you know the very next word he says, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name and shall deceive many. Again in Matthew chapter seven he says, uh, that many will come in that day and say unto him, Lord, Lord, we've done this and that and healed and done all of that business in thy name. And Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. 
Now the works of the flesh, which are these, lasciviousness and, and immorality and these degenerating things come as a direct result of the flesh. But the devil is a religious being and he's out to deceive people. He can't deceive people with a bottle of gin or something like that. That's just the flesh that lusts after those things. You'd do that even if there were no, no, no devil at all. You'd, you'd be a wicked person if there wasn't a devil loose. You'd lust and kill, as James said in chapter four and verse four. But you see, when you talk about deception, that comes under the heading of Satan's activity. Paul said uh, that Satan's ministers are transformed into ministers of light. Thus you can see, beloved, he has a reason to write this when he said, I told you so. I told you so. I'm trying to get you straightened out, he's saying. Now, you'll look at verse three again. I want to call your attention to the latter part of that. He said, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. You see, sin had defeated these people and the man of sin should be revealed. They not only were disturbed and deceived, but they were defeated. They had fallen away. Uh, sin had become so rampant in their day and, and uh, it's even worse today. And this prophecy, it telescopes clear on end to the last days and the days in which we're living. And you know what's wrong with many of you people looking at me tonight, sitting here in this auditorium, people tuned to this broadcast. Uh, there's so much sin around you until sin doesn't look like sin anymore. And this is the thing we really have to watch. It has a way of defeating you and you become insensitive to sin. And sin is not exceeding sinful as Paul says in Romans 6. And sin doesn't have the, it doesn't have the awful look to it that it once had. We need a generation of Americans that can tell you what sin is. We live in a day when you can't tell what sin is anymore because it's, it's, the church has competed with the world today in dress, in mannerisms, in activities, in a constant, why uh, this, uh, today at lunch, my wife and I were going to meet some friends, her and Barbara up at the, up at the restaurant, up Interstate 75, and it was pouring down rain, and my, these Baptists, there's not any people in this world as afraid of water as Baptists. I declare to my soul, Baptists are afraid of water. We had about 1,500 Baptists that stayed at home this morning because it's raining. Afraid of water. But you know what? The 55,000 that was at the Bengal football game, they were not afraid of water. No, man, they're not afraid of water. People go to a ball game, they're not afraid of water. But I tell you, these Baptists are. Isn't that strange? Falling away, letting things of the world take them. You say, well, now, you're against, shut your mouth. I wasn't talking about being against anything. I'm just talking about attitudes of people. That's what I'm talking about. Where the priorities lie. What is, what is first in your life? This is the thing that's important. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. You get this straight. When the falling away comes, it means people become discouraged. And they're not warm hearted. They're not filled with the spirit. They can criticize. They can find fault. And everything's going to the dogs. They, can't, they don't know anything about the grace of God. I know some preacher brethren, and God love them, they're so far over on the right until they've already jumped off. They're against everything and everybody. Strange thing to me, you know, why people are like that. Good night. We have, we have enough to fight without fighting one another. It's a strange thing, but this is the God's truth. And you Christian people, you, you ought to be fighting the devil instead of fighting each other. Some of you men and women puffed up in the home, won't speak to each other, supposed to be Christian and won't have anything to do with each other in the home. Your home is deteriorating. And you know what? This is part of the falling away because God says the home life in the last days of his people will deteriorate. And this is what's happening. So you can see there, there are defeated people. And look at verse 11 in this chapter. And for this cause, God is going to send them strong delusion. Now this is about the sinners. So you see, the Christians are defeated and these sinners are, uh, they're deluded. They're, they, they, they've believed, or they will believe this delusion. Listen, 
You want me to tell you something, sinner man? Now you sit there and listen to me a moment. God will let you believe what you want to believe. Did you know that? You say, well, if God's sovereign and he's too good to put people in hell, son, if you want to believe that, you go on and you will smell the brimstone pretty soon. Because I've got news for you. you you're not the judge and you're not the jury. I, I can tell you here and now that God is sovereign and he says that he will send them strong delusion. They're deluded. That's what will happen in the last days. That's what's wrong with the American people today. They've been hoodwinked by the devil into believing and thinking, well, there's nothing to that. I've been preaching hell fire. I've been preaching brimstone. I visited a businessman in this town uh, just the other night and he told me flat footed, he said, I don't believe there's a hell. I said, you shut your mouth. You don't have any right calling God a liar. You sit there and listen to me. Because God said fire, and if God said fire, he meant fire. And some little old pinheaded businessman that thinks uh, that he can rear back and say uh, there isn't any such thing as a hell. Brother, he's got an awakening coming. Because God is sovereign, and he is able to give a man strong delusion and cause him to believe what he wants to believe. God's not going to pick you sinners up against your will and pitch you bodily into the kingdom of God. Son, you're going to have to repent to get in. And I'm glad it's that way because that's the way I had to come. And I'm so glad God's no respecter of persons. I had to repent of my sins. I had to tell the Lord I was a sinner. I had to confess to him that I was going to hell and I needed help. And you know what? He helped me. He gave me eternal life. That's the joyous part about it. So you see, these people are deluded. But look at verse 12. He said that they should believe the lie that they all, not part of them, but all might be damned who believed not the truth. Did you notice that? That they all might be damned or judged as you'll find in the marginal reference of your Bible. So you see, that just emphasizes what I'm talking to you about tonight that they all might be damned. God is no respecter of persons. You say, well, what about the heathen? Well, what about the heathen in Cincinnati? It's strange how uh, this woman was talking to me about a couple of weeks ago. I was calling and she said, well, Reverend, if God is a judge and there's a hell like you say, say, what about the heathen? I said, that's a good question. What about the heathen here in Cincinnati? You know, she didn't much like that. We don't have to go to Timbuktu to find heathens. You got them here in Cincinnati in Hamilton County. Heathen in their way of life. Heathen, heathen in, the way, in their thinking. Heathen in their, in their attitudes. Heathen in their attitude toward God. Brother, you don't have to go to some faraway land to find heathens. All you need to do is walk down the street. Start speaking to people. You'll start speaking to heathens. A heathen is a man who rebels against God and will not permit God to have right away in his life. That's what a heathen is, if you want to know the scriptures. That's what the Bible says. So you see, my friend is clear and plain, and he's going to damn people. Don't you get the wrong concept of God, because God is long-suffering, because judgment's not executed against the work speedily. The hearts of the young men set to do evil continually, the preacher Solomon said. Remember this, it's like the old proverb, the mills of the gods grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. Payday will come. You don't have to worry about that. It'll come. Romans 6, 23 said the wages of sin is death. Payday will come. You read a book of Galatians again, you'll find if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you'll reap life everlasting. Payday will come. You know what to help all of you people, have all of us here tonight? To get it in our souls that payday is coming. Payday is going to come. God will pay us off for what we've done. They'll be, men will be judged according to Revelation 20 according to their works. You say, well, if that be true, there'll be degrees of punishment in hell. You're catching on. That's what the Bible teaches. There will be degrees of punishment in hell. And there's going to be rewards in heaven. We're not all going to be a bunch of zombies up in heaven. Everybody look alike, talk alike, think alike, smell alike, be alike. We're going to be different. We'll have personalities in heaven. And people are not all going to be alike in hell. We'll all be uh, in one place or the other. But I guarantee you there's going to be differences. Well, you say we'll all be like Jesus. That means in the state 
of his body that, that sin and weakness and disease cannot touch us. That's, that's what he's talking about. But we'll have personality in heaven. They'll, we'll talk. We'll converse. We'll know even as we are known. Our bodies will be incorruptible. Uh, we'll be undefiled. We'll be learners, according to Ephesians 2, that in the ages to come he might show unto us exceeding riches of his grace and mercy toward us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Sure, we'll have personality the same way in hell. The rich man was conscious. It's sort of like Harold, uh, Carl Hatch was talking the other night about these people going around denying the, denying the reality of hell. Said, all right, you go ahead and deny it because in the book of Revelation, death and hell shall be cast into the lake of fire and men will be tormented day and night forever. Uh, so these no hellites don't gain anything, don't you see? Because there's a lake of fire at the end of the road where men shall be tormented. And I'm talking about now, look at verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Brother, when you ignore that Bible word saved, then you've missed it. Strange. You know how people do a lot of calling. You can talk about the weather. You can talk about politics. You talk about uh, sports. You can talk about drama. You can talk about art. I remember years ago, I was talking to an old woman here in this city, and she was an art lover and a collector of art, very wealthy woman. And you know what? As long as I was talking about art, my, my, she was, she was, she was really with me. And then I turned to her and I said, I want to talk to you about getting saved, being born again. She says, my religion is my business and I don't discuss it with anyone. Boy, I'd really put my finger on a sore spot, you know. She went along all right as long as I was talking about the weather and talking about art and talking about politics and talking about food. But when I started talking about being saved, she cleaned off the place and had a fit. I mean, right there. Really, it really touched her. And that's what's wrong with many of you listening to me today. You don't like the word. That's why it's hard to get a doctor saved, a lawyer saved. There's a doctor here in Cincinnati and he's, he's near death. He is a personal friend of mine. I've prayed for him, put my arm around his shoulders and prayed for him. And I said to him the last time I saw him to converse with him and thanked him for what he had done for my family. And I said, doctor, would you please call me and let's have lunch together and talk about being saved. He said, when I get ready to discuss it, I'll call you. And tonight he lies in a body that's helpless, just like a vegetable. He waited too late, brother. He didn't call the preacher that is trying to keep him out of hell. And the book said, except you repent, you'll perish. All of you, every one of you. That includes the doctor, the dentist, the lawyer, or the preacher that has not been born again, even to Pope Paul, the whole bunch. Of course, the closest he can get is purgatory. But you know, my friends, we need to get our thinking straight. You're either saved or lost. I mean, that's it, period. You say, well, that's strong. Sure, it's strong. But you know what, every last one of you people looking at me tonight, you know and I know that I'm telling the truth if this book is true. That's it. You know, I'm not trimming anybody. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to palaver anybody. I'm telling you like it is because the, the crowd constituted like it is in this auditorium or out in the radio audience never be together again until out in outer space where the day of judgment holds forth. And I don't want to answer for the blood of people on my hands. I'm determined never to meet God with blood on my hands. I told a story of when I was a young man, I almost committed murder and it's been a thing. It's been a help to me through the years, through anger and I'd been terribly wronged and, and the thing really got me and I guess every man that's got a temper has had some experiences at least and I bless the name of God forever and ever. Uh, that he was with me. But you know, since I've surrendered to preach and I'm a servant of God, you see, I can, I can commit murder even as a preacher. If I fail to warn the wicked of his wicked way, then God said, I'm going to require their blood at your hand. It's a solemn warning that I am enjoined with that I've got to face. And let me tell you people something, you pew warmers. Let me tell you something. When you face the judgment seat of Christ, it's gonna be a different story, men and women. And if I could stir you up, if I could let you see that payday is coming. There's a young gentleman in this service tonight. He's a young preacher, he's thinking, with his lovely family of starting a church, and he and I have talked about it. And I've given him encouragement, told him if God is in it, go ahead and do it. 
And I'd like to say to him and many others listening today, if God is in something, do it. If you make a mistake, God overlooks mistakes when they are of the head and not of the heart. God knows that we are feeble at the very best. He understands that our frame is dust. Uh, God knows how weak we are, that we dwell in a body that's compassed about with disease and sickness and sin, and unrighteousness. God knows all of this. How does he know it, preacher? Because he dwells in these bodies. God the Holy Ghost dwells in every one of us who have been saved by the grace of God. And so my friends, God knows, and I encourage you as much as I possibly can to lay your life on the line and say, here it is, Lord, and for you dear unsaved people, oh, God love you. God help you to see the value of coming to Jesus. The Bible says, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You may gain the world and then damn your own soul and perish forever and forever. And bear in mind that I've never preached from this pulpit annihilation because there isn't any such thing as annihilation. You can only be destroyed in one form and exist in another. And that's why the Bible said, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I heard a preacher say some time ago, it's strange why, where the Bible says the worm dieth not. And he said it seems to infer, infer that a man may become a worm in the form, something like that. Can you imagine in a lake of fire worms with, with human intelligence burning forever where the screams of the damned shall be heard day and night forever and ever from the very existence and the presence of God in the darkness of eternal night and have your intelligence, have your mind and remember in like a landmark auditorium or the landmark hour or some man knocked on your door, some little girl and I should like to say this, if I have enough radio time left, uh, Henry and uh, Ruthie uh, sitting down here. Henry's one of our superintendents, Henry Helton. His little girl came back. She's a teenager tell about witnessing the other night. Met a man on the street. She's only about 14 years of age, 13 or 14. And she, this man said, well, uh, tell me how to be saved or something like that. And went ahead. She went through the plan of salvation three times. And he said to her, said, well, ask me where I go to church. She said, that's not important. Being born again is what's important. And he said, well, ask me where I go to church. This is about the way the conversation went. And when she had exhausted her testimony to that man, he said, I sing in the landmark choir. One of these birds sitting up here, I guess. Or in one of the other choirs, you know. And that little girl, my, she's just as cute as she can be. She's telling this man how to be saved. And he was enjoying it thoroughly because she was going through the plan of salvation. You know what, to some of you people, there's been a teenager. There's been someone handed you a tract or you've, uh, you've been visited by somebody, or the prayers of a dear, sweet old grandmother in another state, and she has talked to you when you went home for a family reunion. And she said, son or daughter, won't you be saved? There's not a person listening to me tonight, but what, somewhere, sometime, somebody crossed your path and talked to you about the loving Jesus who saves and satisfies. And when you wake up in hell, son, as the saying goes, it'll be too late then. It's in this life when you repent. It's in this life when you turn from sin unto God. And that's the meaning of this lesson because no man knows when Jesus shall return. It may be at morning when the day is breaking. It may be at high noon. It may be in the four o'clock watch. But keep in mind, he's coming back. Let us stand for prayer, shall we please? Oh, God bless this broadcast and this service today and anoint it with the blessed spirit of God that sinners will be saved. It's time to do that which is right. Some of you wasted your life. I want you to get up out of that seat and come tonight and put your trust in a crucified, buried, and risen Lord. Will you come while we sing? Come on.